Parent and Family Resource The Parent and Family Resource Review, February and March 2021. This presentation is a review of the concepts, ideas, terminology and Divine Truth basics covered in the Parent and Family Resource videos so far. Recorded in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia on the 5th of March 2021 at 10am. Welcome to the Parenting Principles Program. This is a resource for parents um, or caregivers, uncles, aunts, anybody basically, or even if you're a child of parents, you may find the principles that are used in here, in this, re in this resource, helpful in your own personal progression, spiritual progression, or also just as a way to become a more uh, loving, truthful human. The focus on the program is on love, truth, and a relationship with God. At the beginning when I first started, I wasn't so interested in a relationship with God. As I have um, progressed and worked through certain issues within myself, really about how I felt towards God, I now see how, for me, essential and it is to have a relationship with God in order to understand, from God's perspective, what love and truth means and to get an education in love. It's up to you. God's given us each free will whether we want to have a personal relationship with God or not. So God's still got in, um, provisions for all of us to learn about love and truth. And there, as I've spoken about in a previous video, there's a framework of laws that are acting upon everybody's soul in the entire universe. And we can learn a lot about love and truth via our own exploration and efforts as well. It just is not as rapid and it takes a lot of effort. It's still worth doing from my perspective. Now, some things that have been covered in previous videos that I just wanted to review. Um, so they're all in one area and we can refer back to this just for a quick reference point. Firstly, we talked about some qualities and all of these qualities have a lot of principles within them that we're going to go into more detail in, in future videos. Talked about qualities to develop and was growing in love and truth. And I spoke about how love and truth go together. Truth is always loving and you know, and love needs truth, I feel like to actually understand love, you need truth. So, yeah, we spoke about love and truth and we spoke about love and receiving divine love, which is the love from God that only God can give to us and that how that changes the nature of the soul. We also spoke about natural love and that's the love air within a human um, towards God or to another human or towards creatures and to the universe and how we can develop that from our own efforts. I spoke about truth um, and absolute truth being like the facts of the universe and truth from God's perspective, which is the truth, it's absolute, there's no negotiation there, it's, it is the truth from God and how we can receive that via the conscience, which I love because it's a inbuilt truth mechanism, like a mechanism in the soul, like a direct channel to get God's truth, which I think is very cool. And then we I spoke about personal truth and that's the facts that have happened to you in your life as well as your feelings about what has happened and you, your experiences, but the truth of your experiences, not the facade about them or the fabricated version or the one that you want to believe. It's what actually happened and how you actually felt about it, like you truly felt about it. And that's something uh, to develop um, in yourself uh, and to go from a place where you're in denial or lying to yourself to actually becoming very truthful about yourself to yourself. Very important part of this program. We, I then spoke about humility, which I defined as, and it's the, same, it's the same definition as in the divine truth teachings, of being feeling every feeling you have, whether it's um, pleasurable or painful, and being humble to feeling whatever it is you feel. And the importance of having you know, a humble heart or being, I, I, like humility is the thing that is going to, if you don't have humility, you're not going to feel anything. So developing that qualities is very, very important. I briefly spoke about faith, having faith in something. If you don't have a faith that your life can get better, you're never going to take an action for it to, to get better. If you don't have faith in change, that's something you can change. You're never going to actually do anything in order to change and you'll remain the same. So having faith is a very important quality to develop as well. Faith actually naturally develops the more the actions you take and the more that you reflect and add up the positive things in your life. So... 
you know, for me, I had um, didn't have much faith in God or even in, you know, the way that God has created to uh, come to actually understand and become at one with God in order to love as God loves. Um, but I experimented and took actions and tried things and reflected upon them and modified them and all these things. And over time, a series of events happened which grew my faith in you know, the way to progress towards becoming a more loving person. My faith in God's process um, increased because I could see the results and I could measure them. And so now I have sort of a firm faith that I know it works. I know that feeling my emotions is a good thing. I know that it's going to bring me more happiness. I know that the only change is soul-based change because I have done it, I've experienced it, and I have faith in the whole process now. So growing faith is a wonderful quality to have. And, if, and at the beginning, you have to kind of have faith that there's a possibility that things are going to get better because else you won't even try doing it. And if you just look in your own life, if you look at things that you think you can't do or are going to be impossible, you know, like a lot of people are sort of like, nah, there's no way that I could, I don't know, like choose anything. <laughs> you know, there's no way that I could become a super mathematician. That's probably something for me. You know, I'll never really understand that. Well, I've got no faith that I can grow from where I am now to the future. Now, I don't totally feel that way. That was just an example. Um, I just know I need to deal with some things in order that I will be able to become more open to absorbing mathematical equations and understanding them. If you have no faith in it, you're never going to act in a different manner. So if you have no faith in love and you've got no faith in truth, one of the first places to start, you know, if you don't think it's going to make your life better by being more truthful, if you don't think it's going to make your life better or bring you increased happiness by being more loving and truthful, then you're not going to do it. And I'd suggest you don't have faith that your life can be different in a positive way. So that's a very important quality. And you can apply that, you know, having faith in God and that God and in faith in God's goodness. That can pull you through a lot of things when, when it feels hard or you feel down or there's certain things that are happening in your life that you don't understand. Having faith in God's goodness and faith in God's laws, that things are going, that will work out and they'll work out the best for every person possible in the best, easiest, most gentle way that God possibly can give it to us uh, with what we're open to receiving. You know, you can have faith in that process and it makes life a lot more enjoyable and less, um, for me, less fearful about, about life and various events that happen in my, my, my life. Another quality we talked about developing was at, taking action. And if you don't take any action, nothing happens. Now, I don't know if you really can't take an action because even say saying, I'm not going to do anything and you sit on the couch, you've still taken an action to sit on the couch and you've still made a decision and you've still made a choice. Even the action of saying, well, I'm not going to do anything. You know, you've kind of still acted. It's just not in a very positive, in the sense of not a loving direction. So you're not going to have a very positive outcome. Things are going to not go so well. In this context, I'm talking about do some experiments, have a go, take what I'm saying. Um, I would explore further. Go to the teachings of Divine Truth at www.divinetruth.com. Find out more. Like they have so much information there and these videos are taking principles of divine truth and they're applying them specifically to parenting so the source of my information is the divine truth teachings um, which the source of that information is directly from god so or the experiences that jesus and mary have had over many many years and the things they've learnt about about the well the positive benefits and the wonderful you know results and opportunities that are gifted once you start growing in love and being more truthful and things. So, yeah, suggest to go go to the source of information for, for more in-depth, many, many hours of information on some of these things that I'm talking about, like, you know, love and truth. There's many hours on that, many hours on humility and on faith and on taking action, on all the things I'm talking about. I'm just covering the basics uh, or what I've referred to in a previous presentation as divine truth basics so that you have a go-to point if you've never come across divine truth or, um, you know, if you don't choose to, to listen to the, the Divine Truth teachings, that you have at least a reference for some things, um, for the things that I'm speaking about that you can apply in your everyday life. I suggest as you apply them, you're going to have a lot of questions. Uh, feel free to ask them, and I can either point you in the direction of specific resources, 
or if you go to the Divine Truth channel, they have a search engine, um, like a search capacity where you can actually, you know, search keywords and find out more information. Anyway, we've covered love, truth, humility, faith, action. Then there's desire. Desire. Very important in one's life. You can also call it, say, aspiration, which is like what you'd love for your future or what you really, really want, what you want with your whole soul and you're passionate about. That's your desire. You know, you can have desires in a loving direction and an unloving direction, and the results will be will be acted out in your life, and you will see what you know the things that are happening in your life will portray where your aspiration is at. Um, I spoke briefly as well about will and desire, your will being your current soul condition, where you are right now, and then having your desire being whether your desire and your aspiration is to become more loving or it's to become more unloving. And depending on what desire you have will mean in what direction you go. Desire is a wonderful thing to develop because even if you have unloving desires, if you act on them like fully, if, if you have had unloving desires, and you've acted on them fully and, you know, really strongly, then you have a sense of, you know, you've actually developed your desire, even if it's in an unloving direction. And that means that once you, you know, hear some truth and you can see that there's a different possibility and you've had greater happiness in your life, you can just turn your desire in the other direction and head in the loving direction and you'll have at least a development of what it means to actually act on desire and to understand all that. I often... Um, make the comment and have this sort of feeling that in the world there's all these people and they've got some passionate desires in a really unloving direction imagine if like they turned it to good you know imagine what they could do if they actually turned it to good it's sort of like I think of these big petroleum companies or people who do all these engineering feats you know that are all based to uh, you know create more war and weapons and whatever imagine if they just took all those resources all of that intelligence all of those that information and turned it to good, you know, like maybe inventing a whole new power system that could actually be used for free in the world that you didn't have to like pay for or that used, you know, not all of the world's natural resources and didn't create so much environmental damage and didn't kill so many people and didn't harm so many people. And imagine if we used all of those resources for good. You know, there's someone who's acting on a desire in a direction that's causing a lot of problems in the world. Let's shift it the other way and imagine what we could do or what could be done. Yeah, that's a little bit, a little bit about desire. Then I talked about emotion. There's so much resistance to really raw emotion in the world. I spoke about how there's a threshold of acceptance of emotion. And if someone's like too emotional, judged depending on someone, and really that's a, what do you call it, a perspective thing because for some people really emotional is you know, no one's got a problem with it. And for other people, being just slightly emotional is like a huge, you know, that man, that person's so emotional. And there's a lot of judgment and criticism about emotion and emotion. We need to change our relationship with emotion because God's designed the soul to be emotional, 100% emotional. It's, we're always going to be an emotional being. And the aim, and I suppose the goal is to express and be emotional. Like that means experience our emotions, whether painful or pleasurable, experience them. As I've said, I suggest to do it in a, a self-responsible manner. And that means like not acting on your dark emotions or the, you know, your unloving emotions towards others or yourself. You know, it means dealing with those in a self-responsible manner. I mean, maybe take yourself to your room or your bathroom or your car or whatever and release those emotions or get a punching bag and smack your punching bag if you're really angry. Let them out, let them flow. I think emotion has been referred to as like energy in motion. And I think of it as it needs to flow through you. So there's a lot of emotion that's caught up and stored in us. And I know there's a lot of psychological teachings, you know, psychology teachings about these things. And it's not the theory. There's some really good theory out there on emotions. I've found the teachings of divine truth again to be the most effective way of actually understanding my own emotions and, and understanding how to deal with them. Um, I have had experience with psychology and some, of, some things are really good, but a lot of it I just find too intellectual and never really makes real change because the soul's not changing, which is an emotional process. And the most effective way I'm finding is when there's an emotion there, feel it and then 
you know, get on with your day. And then there's another emotion, feel it, get on with your day, let yourself express it. And you'll find, I think some people will find that their pleasurable emotions are just as confronting for them as the negative emotions or what they deem them negative emotions. None of them are really negative or positive. Just some are more unloving or loving. Every emotion is an indicator about something in your life. So anger, for instance, a wonderful guide to find more out about yourself. We can be angry because, you know, and if we apply this to parenting and children, children are like little barometers, I see. And sometimes their anger in a family is highlighting that there's some major issues in the family, that there's some unfair treatment, that there's some unloving treatment, that there's a moral treatment. And when we just get upset and angry at the child, rather than figuring out well, what's the cause of this child's anger, if we could see the anger as a guide and say, all right, they're expressing their anger, what is it? Is it that there's something happening that really is not okay and they're responding it with this, you know, like, no, I don't like that this is wrong. Like that's the anger is expressing that. Or, and underneath that, there might be a whole lot of grief and maybe fears and all kinds of different things that is going on for them. But that is you know, trying to help them to see more about what's, what's going on? Or is this anger just a tantrum because someone's not getting a demand met or they're not getting an, their addictions met? And honestly, adults, we have a lot of tantrums and a lot of our rage and anger is just having a tantrum that we didn't get what we wanted. And we need to see ourselves as these little petulant children that we are, all kind of like running around thinking we should have what we want. Really, we're kind of like around two years old. <laughs> In some areas, you know, some of us aren't even really growing up yet, to be honest, not emotionally, because we're not taking, you know, or spiritually, we're not taking self-responsibility for our own emotions. We take them out on everyone else. We expect everyone else to do things for us. You know, we don't feel them. We want to act in them. So we feel angry and then we want to go and attack or blame somebody else or make it someone else's problem just to get away from it. You know, we want to make a big hoo-ha. And this happens like in governments and you know, it's reflected everywhere in society. In a previous presentation, I mentioned how the family is like a micro climate of greater society. What's happening in the family is happening in greater society. If we change what happens in the family, then society will change because if collectively enough people make changes in their homes, then the next generation is going to have make some changes. And if they make changes, you know, soul-based changes and in a direction of love over a number of generations, rapid change could occur but it is going to start with us as parents or adults in in the world making different decisions i feel passionate about the family because personally i've seen how positively the dynamic can change when even one parent makes shifts in a family and how the um the impact that has on the children in a positive direction and i also see how that's making an impact in the greater world, like in the sense of then how the children interact with other children and just their sense of selves, like they actually can become an inspirational example to others in the world if they so desire. For me, I feel passionate about love and truth and God's way. And yeah, I just want to share some of the benefits and, and say, hey, look, these are ways that you could do it if, if you're interested. So that's what these videos are about. So that's a little bit about emotion. Let yourself feel it and let your children express it. Let them, if you've got a problem with emotion, deal with it so that even if you're not wanting to like feel your feelings, that you have an allowance for the children to feel theirs. Now, I suggest if you don't want to feel your own emotion, you are going to shut your children down without saying a word. You can say to them, it's okay, darling, you can feel what you feel. But if you have a feeling of like, no, I don't want to feel deep grief under any situation, when that child hits up a bit against grief, they might feel a little bit of it, but that when it gets to the point that you're not okay with, they're not going to feel it either. Again, I'm talking about quite young children, let's say under the age of 12, um, rather than as they get older, but young children are going to reflect you and from a very early age. So, you know, they can be two or three and be suppressing their emotions already, depending on what the family environment is open to. Also with anger, for instance, depending on what you are as a parent or an adult uh, accept. So you might be fine with volatile, like angry, blaming, you know, rage. Your child will do that and you'll just be like, yeah, whatever. Now other people will be totally not okay with that and they'll try and suppress that rage in the children. Whereas other people will be totally fine with passive aggressive rage as long as there's no shouting. 
and there's just like a whole projection and there's a load of passive aggression coming out, people will be like, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. So depending on what you uh, accept or what you don't accept will depend on how what your children can express. When they're very small, they may express things that make you feel very uncomfortable specifically so you can feel your discomfort and figure out what it is that you're uncomfortable with emotion. Uh, when we first had children, I had never heard the teachings of divine truth. I didn't know any of these principles. I didn't know anything. And I found it overwhelming to have a child who just screamed all the time, who just never, like there was a period of time where um, our daughter was so unhappy and she just cried and cried and cried and cried. Looking back, I can see how much grief I was suppressing, how much rage I was suppressing, um, how much you know fear I was suppressing. And because of all that suppressed emotion, she just was reflecting me and, and my ex-husband, but I'm just going to talk about me here in this example, just reflecting and it was just all coming out of her and I wanted to soothe her, I wanted to feed her, so basically give her food to be, make her be quiet. I wanted to, like I tried just letting her scream for hours, which in hindsight, you know, just feels so wrong now because I was basically like saying, well, you need to deal with your stuff and I'm not going to deal with any of mine. And that's a very um, irresponsible thing I did because I was the one who was, she was reflecting, you know, in this, in this instance. And so that was a very unloving thing I feel for me to do. It was sort of like, well, you have to deal with my issues. As I've learned more about love and about truth, I now am very firm on that, no, my issues are mine. They're not, they're not about the children. Any feeling that I have within myself is mine, is about me. And because I'm an adult, it was in me long before the children came along. The children just are exposing something in me emotionally. I now have a choice. Am I going to feel it and be, become, you know, and that would be a loving action to take? Am I not going to feel it? That's an unloving action to take. It is loving to feel emotion and let yourself feel it in a self-responsible manner. So that's not taking it out on anybody. It's not blaming it on anybody. It's not hurting anybody with it. It's not acting on it, in it. It's feeling it, releasing it, letting it out. And it's so important because no change can happen unless your soul changes. The only way your soul can change, like things can be released from it or, you know, in it, is via feeling an emotion. Uh, that's another thing is in children, if you suppress an emotion in them, then that's stored in their soul. So, you know, that, that's then contained there and will have to be felt at some point. It will need to come out. So that's why it's so lovely to just let emotions flow through kids. Like if they're having a tantrum, let them have the tantrum. You know, they're little, they can do it. If it makes you feel uncomfortable, go feel how uncomfortable you feel. But let them have their, emo their tantrum and their emotion because if they're allowed the entire experience, they'll go through a whole series of emotions and generally from a tantrum and then through all kinds of different emotions until they get to grief and then they have a big cry, they'll release it then they'll get up and go off and play. That's pretty much what happens if you allow a child to go through the whole series of, of feelings. And that's what us as adults need to do as well. So it's an important um, thing. We'll talk a lot about emotion. Yeah, so some of those, the qualities that we just covered in summary were love and truth, humility, faith, action, desire, and emotion. So those are all things to do to look at and to let yourself experience and to develop in, during this program. I also just mentioned the human soul and in review we discussed how we have a soul and that God has created these souls with, you know, our personality and a nature, like we have a, a unique nature and personality in our soul. We have passions, desires. Um, it's like it has all our memories and all the things that have happened to us, all the experiences that we have in it. Um, it has our aspirations, our desires, motivations, everything that's going on within us. That's the real us. Then we have a spirit body that interfaces with the spirit world and we have a physical body which is what's interfacing with the earth life and the earth world. So when we like this physical body perishes or basically you don't feel enough emotion and you don't you become a more loving person then your body gets all decrepit and breaks down that's how I kind of look at it. We're slowly breaking down because of our lack of love and our desire to remain in an unloving state. And so it ends up not being able to support itself anymore and it dies. And then we have a spirit body. 
and that's interfacing with the spirit world. And where we end up in the spirit world is about our soul condition and how much love we have developed. And I feel like the earth is a lovely provision because God's created that we can ming intermingle with many different types of people from many different types of life and with nature and with, you know, well, kind of beautiful areas. Uh, the world and the environment's been, the natural environment's been so severely degraded now that even the places that are so called beautiful, I feel, are probably not as beautiful as they could be or were before humans caused so much destruction. So the soul is the real us and we have also, um, I spoke about how there's uh, expressions of the soul and so there's what we call soul mates and there might be male and female, female and female or male and male expression of that one soul. You're both, those, they're just bodies but the one soul is all of you. So it's very, like I just, I want to know who my soulmate is now and I'm seeing how the importance of acting on my passions and my desires and being myself and being truthful and honest and seeking to love. For me, I've got quite a number of issues to deal with of love of self. We'll talk more about that. And also love of others. I, I need to develop a passionate desire to know and recognize and love my soulmate. And as we've spoken a bit about with love, love is a gift. Can't be demanded or expected. And I'm going through a lot of issues about my demands and expectations on men and relationships. And it's causing me to confront a lot of gender issues and also about women and my relationship with my mother and women, you know, women's issues and how I feel about myself as a woman and how I feel myself as a woman in relationship to men and all of these things, you know, all those things I'm sort of talking about, they're all in my soul and they're all these beliefs that I've picked up along the way, but I have this lovely aspiration again from my soul aspiration. I want to know my soulmate um, and I really want to understand and know my own soul now. And I'm really looking forward to meeting him and seeing what he's like and, and seeing the whole expression of our soul, you know, like I'm starting to understand some of the expressions of my, of me, uh, you know, of this bit of the soul. It's hard because it's not really me and him, it's us. <laughs> but we're not yet a yet an us because it's kind of, um, I find it a bit complex because, you know, sometimes it can so feel like you're just you on your own. But when you start opening up to this concept that you're a soul, well, it's not just you on your own. Uh, God's made us a soul mate uh, from what I've heard. But I also have this feeling now in me of just this best friend and a playmate for us. And God wants us to have a personal relationship with God. But God also gave us a whole soul that we can be with. And that means like two physical bodies and two, you know, expressions of the spirit body as well. And that's a wonderful way, I think, to get to know the other expressions of our soul and get to know us. And I feel, I feel like God's given us this opportunity to come to earth in order to become self-aware and to understand truths about the universe and about love and truth and, you know, how to be humble and what, what it means to have faith and to really, and really understand desire. I feel like desire is this very important thing to understand. And if we can understand it on earth, we're going to stand us in good stead when we, when we head to the spirit world. I mentioned in the previous presentation how going to the spirit world, you know, we have sleep and so we spend quite a number of, or a good portion of our lives actually in the, in the spirit world because in our sleep state, we are in our spirit body and we can interact and have discussions and interact with others. And most of us don't remember it, but some people do. And we can actually have, you know, um, we're having experiences in the sleep state so that when we go there, it's not a big shock. And I think God's created that lovely provision for us in order that we can experience both the spirit world and the physical world, even while we're in a physical body. So we can experience the physical world and the spirit world and come to know and understand the spirit world before we leave the earth life and go and live there. So the soul, I, um, it's so, uh, like why I'm mentioning the soul is that if you don't have the basic understanding that you are a soul and everything within you is actually from your soul, it's not in your brain and it's not in your mind of your spirit body, it's in your soul. So when your physical body goes, you know, like it dies, then your spirit body's there, but the same things are still in your soul. So if you don't want to love and you're, you know, you're not going to magically go, die and go to heaven or to the spirit world or whatever and love suddenly. You're going to feel exactly the same way you do now in the spirit world. To me, it seems quite logical to actually deal with stuff on the earth 
you know, where we live on the earth and to learn as much as I, for me personally, how I can about love and truth and the way that God's laws work and how the universe works, etc. Because the more that I know about that, then the more, you know, in my soul as a feeling of understanding, because I don't really think that you can intellectually understand something. I think you, like, it feels to me that your real understanding is when there's a soul-based understanding and then you know it and you know it and it's in you and you understand it fully because you feel it, you understand why, all of these different things and that causes you to then really understand something. Whereas when someone just gives you a theory or you just have a thought about something, it's not real understanding yet. And, you know, it's what I'm sort of was alluding to earlier. Like if you just take physical actions, uh, it's not really going to work out so well. But if you change your soul and you take soul-based actions, automatically you will act differently. That's what I've, I've uh, discovered by, you know, engaging this, this way. The soul is, I sometimes think of it a bit like a container. Or you could think of it like a glass of water, you know, like it's full up with all kinds of um, things like your emotions, your aspirations, your passions, your desires, your experiences, memories, things that have happened to you in the past. All of those things, are all the emotions that you haven't felt and you haven't let flow through you, they're all in there. So you might have a glass of water that's all kind of full. So your soul is kind of like a, let's say, make the analogy of a glass of water. So you have your glass of water and in it, it's all full. So all in here where the water is, the water's all up to here. And in here is all your passions, desires, aspirations, all of the things that have happened to you in your life, all of, you know, the suppressed emotions that you got, you never felt and you never actually worked through. They're all in there, right? So that's the, the, the analogy of yourself. Now, say if that's all full to the top, nothing really else can get in. So you need to let some of that out in order to get new truth. That's an emotional process. So for instance, you have, you know, you hear, you hear some theory and you think, oh, yeah, okay, so let's, let's take an example. All right, well, you know, Eloisa said that God is loving. Well, I don't think that. I don't believe that. You know, I'm not sure about that. And your, your, your beliefs are saying, no, 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 that's not true in every, all your, own, your past experience. Now, if then you so feel some emotion about that and you go, okay, you might, might pray to God and say, all right, God, I've heard that you're a loving God. Please, can I have some of your love? Or please, can you, you know, show me what you're really like or, you know, have a lot heartfelt desire for that. So then you do that. And I suggest that would be quite an emotional process. So then some of that is going to tip out and it won't go into anyone else's soul. It will just tip out. I just don't want to pour that on my floor. And now you have some room in the glass. So there's some room for some new truth to enter. And if your prayer was sincere, then God can tip in, you know, he, so then now this is the God glass. <laughs> so this is, this is your soul. And God can give you some love and that would change the feeling that you have about, about, about what's going on. And you will then know some truth directly from God about how God feels about you and if God is a loving being, you know, depending on what your prayer was. And so now something new can go in there that's more truthful. And that can just keep happening. So you've got to release out the old, and we'll call it like error, that's the divine truth terminology, which is really like sin or anything that's out of harmony with love is your error. So you pour that out and they keep pouring and let's say you eventually do it, right? So then you've got all of the error gone from you. There's no, no error left, none, all gone. Wonderful. Gosh, I'm looking forward to that place. And then what you can, but as you've done that, I uh, probably need a different color water. You know, you could be praying and you could be receiving more of God's love because you have a desire for that and desire to understand more truth and desire to know more about the universe and all these things. So then you'd be filling up with some, like all this wonderful good stuff, you know, that would be coming in until at one point you'd be at one with God in the sense of that you'll totally understand what it means to be at one with God from God's perspective and at one with God's love. And that means your love as God loves under all circumstances because that's where you would have gotten to. So that's quite a cool thing, I think, about your soul. And then after you reach that point, then there's the soul union state to become at one with your soulmate. But that's another discussion. Right, so now that you've got, say, all you've, you've done, I just wanted to illustrate that your soul is sort of like a container. Now, if there's one thing I wanted to say, though. That's, that was, say, if you desired love and you desired truth and all those things, you'd fill it up. But you could also release an emotion, you know, on one subject and feel about that. But you might not desire God's truth on that, that subject. 
you might not desire to know anything else about, about it. That means that nothing else is going to go in your soul. You know, the other thing's gone, but now there's, there's nothing else replacing it. And that can happen too. If you don't have a desire for truth and you don't have a desire to know more or know something about it, you're not going to act on it. And that's how desire works, as we discussed briefly previously, is that you do need to have a desire for something else to go into your soul. So you may clear out emotions in, in a sense of, you know, you may no longer be influenced by those emotions anymore because you feel through them and you release them. But unless you desire for God's truth or to know truth about something or to find something else out, nothing will replace that. So you might not know stuff in your soul and that's a possibility too. But in, in summary, just very important to understand that you are a soul. You have two expressions of that soul. You only have one soul made in the whole universe. That means that you know if you've had multiple partners, Maybe one of them was your soulmate, but not all of them. And also there's a lot of injury in having many, many partners over our lifetimes because God specifically designed it that there's one other person for us. That's something I feel as well as parent in relation to parents and children is that the more that we suppress children and shut them down and deny their desires and don't let them act, you know, don't teach them just about following their heart and remaining open to possibilities and exploring and having all different experiences to figure out what their soul's passions and desires are, then we're actually suppressing them more and more in order that they won't fully recognize their own soul. And so then when they come to see to look for their soulmate, instead of necessarily finding their real soulmate that God has, you know, created for them, their other half, if you like, though you're not really a half, but you're like the full soul, but rather than recognizing their mate and their actual soul, They'll, they'll probably gravitate to someone who is more in line with their addictions or codependences or their emotional injuries, and they'll have an injured relationship. Now, that might still happen with their soulmate. Even if they recognize their soulmate, you can still have, you know, soulmates can be together and be in totally codependence and addiction and all those kind of things. They're still going to have to work through all of that stuff. They might not even recognize their soulmates and be in a relationship. But as a parent, the more that you can work through your own issues and your own error and come to a place where you allow a child to fully express themselves and from themselves, I mean what God created, their real nature and personality, not what you want or anything like that. You know, I suppose in a way, uh, earth parents' job is really just to develop character or encourage a child to develop their character, which is, you know, the decisions that I suppose are some total of the decisions and choices they make and the experiences they have, whereas their nature and personality, we, we don't want to shut that down in a child. That's the way they're going to, you know, recognize their mate. That's the way they're going to be the happiest in their lives. That's the way they're going to be able to share the most in the world. That's the way they're going to be able to have the most impact on others in the world. And I think it's a, a real big disservice that most of us do as parents is shut our children down and it's all because we as parents aren't humble enough to some of our own feelings and emotions and our own, we're afraid of our own self-expression or we're angry about it or, or it's been shut down in ourselves, you know. Or a lot of us have a lot of grief to feel about, about how we've been treated and about not following our own passions and desires and doing what other people expect or rebelling against what other people expect. So there's many, many different ways that we may have chosen to deal with what's happened in our past but I am encouraging you in this program to work through all of those so that the children in your care have the potential and the possibility and the opportunity to actually be more of themselves and the next generation doesn't have to go through the same pain and suffering that we as adults are going to need to work our way through in order to become more happy and truthful transparent open beings. So I'm going to just draw a little picture of the human soul as a reminder and um, yeah, hope you like their glass analogy and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> so it's clear, I'm just going to redraw the um, human soul as a figurative image. This is not what the human soul looks like. I don't know what it looks like. I don't have my soul eyes on yet, so I've never seen my soul. I can feel parts of my soul, but a lot of mine still, still needs to be more, more open. So to portray it, um, we have a whole soul. That's what God's created, and God created it. It's just saying, yep, God created it, and 
I, I find it quite fascinating, the human soul. And I find it quite overwhelming to think about because I, I don't fully understand, I suppose, my own soul yet. And it's only as, you, as I feel more that I trust that I'll come to understand and know. And there's a lot to learn, I think, about it. It feels like it's an exceptionally complex creation. I'm looking forward to having a good chat with God when I have enough love in myself to understand what God's trying to tell us about the human soul to actually understand it. So for the cases, we're saying that there's one soul and it's sort of in two parts. And as I said before, it could be male and female. It could be male and male. Or female and female. Now, the soul has then two um, physical expressions, if you like, one spirit body and one uh, physical body. And the spirit body interfaces with the spirit world and the physical body interfaces with this physical world. This is because they're together. <laughs> <laughs> probably it looks more like you should draw the man over here and the woman over here often in our in our world because they're quite genders are so um gosh like so just parted a lot in so many areas so it would be lovely when we all deal through our gender issues in order that we can love the other gender just completely with all our heart as well and actually honor them for being what god created rather than being angry at them for not doing the thing we want Anyway, so here we have the soul that God has created, and then God has created the physical, and the spirit body and the physical bodies. But I suppose it's, um, in a way, you know, the act of having sex with, with a partner, and then, you know, that actually then spurs the, that then creates the process for then a baby to form and to grow inside the physical body and then be born. So here we have the physical body, and here we have the spirit body. But really it's the soul that is like controlling all of these, if you like. It's like the soul is the control. The soul is you. It's like the soul is your hard drive. Like that's the thing that's doing it. And then you're just putting different screens or different accessories in and that's sort of expressing yourself. I don't think it's totally like that. I think it's much more complex, but just as an analogy to think about it, you know, your soul is like the supercomputer. It, it has all the data, all the information, everything in it, and it knows everything and it is the real you. So that's just something to... Um, yeah, to, uh, to remind you of. And as I said, it can be male and male, so, you know, and female and female, and that's just a more feminine expression of a single soul or a more masculine expression of a, of a soul, or it can be male and female. So some exciting things to discover if that's the first time you've heard about soulmates and the soul. So, so far we've reviewed love and truth, humility, faith, action, desire, emotion, the human soul and just the basics of it. And it's important to understand the human soul because these teachings, if you don't even have just like a theoretical understanding of that, everything that I'm speaking about is about coming to know and understand your own soul, what's in it, what you truly feel, what you really think, you know, where your thoughts are just a reflection of what you feel. And to understand that it's changing your soul, not your physical body. Like if you change your soul, then all the physical things will change. And we were just talking about how it's like the hard drive or the, the supercomputer part of a, of a computer. You need to like reformat that or remake that, change the information on that in order that it can then change what's happening in your physical life or your spirit body life, you know, in the spirit world life. So that's something that, um, and also if you don't believe in the soul, well, what are you? You're only going to believe in a physical thing, so you're only going to, you know, your, your faith is going to be just in the physical world, not in, in a, in a soul-based change. And as I said before, like, the only real change is soul-based change. And even when people don't understand that, it still happens. Like often you hear about traumatic events or people going through some, you know, you know really big big issue in their life and then they uh, have a lot of emotional response or experience to those things and then their life changes quite dramatically and that's because they actually made a soul-based change on in a certain area and then in that area they change and, and choose different things so I feel like unwittingly like our souls are so powerful 
I've heard there is power, like more powerful than the sun. Like there's a lot of power, there's a lot of energy. And that means there's a huge attraction to your soulmate, which means that if we're not with our soulmates and we're not recognizing our soulmates, we must be some pretty powerful beings to shut and deny and shut all of that down. Because that's one of the greatest forces. It's like a magnetic force. And as I was saying, allowing children to just be themselves and us growing to be that example. So we're modeling to the children what our real soul's passions are. We're being truthful, transparent, all of those things. What a wonderful example I, I believe that is to be in the world. And yeah, this part of this program is for those of you who are interested in that and to experiment with that and see what happens when you make soul-based change. I also want to review just that um, I also talked in a, and previously about the conscience, which is the kind of the direct truth channel between you and God. God's made an inbuilt mechanism, very nice of him, to actually communicate directly and receive truth directly from God. What I love about that is that God can answer any question you have in the entire universe about anything. Now, there is like a little proviso, we have to be open enough to receive the answers. And that's the only thing stopping us, is us. So really the only thing stopping you from knowing all kinds of things in the world is you. I feel also that it's a lot about our soul condition and development and love. The more love that we have in our soul, the more open we are to understanding a whole load of things. And not just understanding, the more we can absorb and actually understand without like too much thought. So I um, notice in my friends, in my friend Jesus, he's quite amazing how much he can absorb, think and do because of the greater capacity for him to absorb information because of his soul condition. And I really enjoy, um, yeah, I really enjoy observing that because I'm like, oh, wow, like that's something that I could do. But love opens up and expands your soul. And sometimes I, I think about that. I'm like, well, what does my soul really look like? You know, like when I, was, when I first started, I used to imagine it's like really shriveled up and kind of like almost like, like a dehydrated, like a prune, you know, like dehydrated and all shriveled and everything. And I feel like when you receive love from God or you make more loving decisions and you, you do it sort of like a, a balm to your soul, like a beautiful elixir that goes and then it sort of like it, it starts gradually opening and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I think about it, well, if you're with one with God, you know, like God's an infinite, massive entity who, well, I'm not sure if it's like literally massive, but feels to me like God is great. And I feel like our souls, I don't know if our souls, I don't think well, we can ever be like that, but I do ex just imagine just getting bigger and bigger. And if we're like more powerful than the sun, the sun's like huge in comparison to us. <laughs> so sometimes I just imagine it and just think, wow, like, yeah, soul's a pretty powerful being. And I imagine it going from like when we're all unloving and we're all in denial and we don't want to know anything about ourselves and we're, you know, angry about everything or, you know, afraid about everything, or whatever. We're all pruned up and shriveled and kind of keeping ourselves exceptionally small. And as we learn and more about love and absorb more love and become more loving people for our own desire, then our soul can expand and becomes puffy and beautiful and soft and lovely. Anyway, it's a bit of an aside. I was on about the conscience <laughs> and just how there is that mechanism to get direct truth from God. Again, um, it's a feeling exchange. It's not a thought exchange. So if you shut down emotionally, you're not going to be able to receive um, answers straight from God. God does have other feedback me mechanisms. We spoke about feedback and conscience, I feel, is like one mechanism. But it's not just a feedback mechanism. The conscience is like a a mechanism that is activated by our desire and the more that we desire to know things and this is a beautiful thing about God like God will give you answers if you have a pure desire and that's regardless if you believe in God or you don't or you believe in love or you don't if you have a sincere pure longing to know and understand truth and have and understand that you will get an answer you will every single time and you can do an experiment and test it for yourself but it's it is a truth um, you do need to differentiate about where you're getting the answer from because if you're totally shut down to, you know, to truth even or whatever and you need to figure out whether the answer is right and that's why I love the conscience because once you can differentiate whether it's God who's giving you an answer or whether it's spirits or yourself or 
you know, something else in the universe that you're getting an answer from, well, usually it would be spirits yourself. You know, then you can recognize, oh, yes, okay, this is an actual truth from God. And that's something that I think is well worth developing and also opening up the possibility to children. And they can experiment with that from as soon as they can understand what you're saying, basically. So, you know, God, and that's the beauty of God's way is God's made it that a, a baby can actually connect and have a relationship with God and become self-aware and understand things via the conscience and things. So God's made a lot of loving provisions for us to learn more truth and to understand love in, in more and more and more. I also spoke about prayer, which I feel is a very important um, tool that we have at our disposal, and that's our personal longing, our desire for, for something. I used to associate prayer with religious means and I had some issues with prayer um, when I first did it because it was sort of always felt like you were just saying words but my heart was never really in it and I didn't really understand or often my prayers and longings were for things that were actually really unloving. So I think there's that song like, thank, thank God for unanswered prayers. <laughs> I really do on some things. But what I've come to understand prayer to be is, is this heartfelt longing that comes out of my soul towards God um, or, you know, at first when I didn't really have a relationship with God, it was towards just the universe. And often, like now, when I really have a sincere longing, that prayer is answered immediately if it's a loving, sincere prayer. And that's a beautiful thing. So often I'll ask God about certain issues in my life or I'll ask for guidance or I'll ask to be exposed. And my prayers used to um, involve things like, please be so explicit that I cannot miss what you are trying to show me <laughs> because I, I, I'm not good with subtlety and I don't get a lot of, like, I just felt like I didn't get a lot of things and I needed things to be so clear that I couldn't miss it. Um, so that was sort of what I would tag on the end of a lot of my longings to God for information about different things and when I really wanted to know something about love or a new truth or things like that. And sometimes it was amazing what happened. I was going through at one point a, an experience where I was longing to understand about um, certain uh, sexual abuse things that had happened in my life. And it was amazing because I had this prayer and I said, please make it as explicit as you possibly can. And it was fascinating. It happened that uh, I think I was watching TV at one point and I just flicked over the channel. Every channel I flicked to had something about, about, um, about sexual abuse on it. Then I went somewhere else and there was like books, like they were just, you know, I think I was in the doctors or um, maybe doctors or I can't remember, psychologists. I was in some waiting room somewhere, I can't remember where it was. And there were just these, these pamphlets and these magazine articles and then there were signs about things and everything. And I was like, okay, I can't get more explicit than this, you know. Um, and so, I, and each one was even to the point of what was being shown, like when I flicked the channels, were things that really brought up some emotions in me, like they exposed some things in me that I hadn't been wanting to see or to look at. And you know, that's like so one example, but there's, there's other things where I've literally like asked for something else, like for maybe more simple, like, you know, I'm not getting something, I'm not understanding. And then all these things would happen. And sometimes even like I might even go to the supermarket and when I've had a sincere prayer, I would just like say hello to someone and they might just say the very thing that I needed to do, like they might, I can't remember a specific example, but it just sometimes it's, it's like God, I feel like, is trying to use any mechanism possible to help us to understand things. And you may have had experiences like this where you go somewhere and someone just starts seemingly randomly, like it can be a stranger just talking to you about something. And you're sort of like, why are they talking about that? I suggest if you reflect on what's actually happening in your life or whatever and just pay a little bit more attention to those things, there may be some things for you to feel in that or for you to understand or come to know or see about yourself or what's happening in your relationship or what's happening in your life. I now see every interaction I have as an opportunity and a gift of, of learning something more about love and about myself and also with particularly with humans, when you have uh, an interaction with another human, you have this beautiful opportunity to learn about them and to learn about something more about God because each person's different. Each person has different soul passions and desires. Sadly, many of us are very shut down and we often just have addictive interactions, meaning that we're not really talking about truth and what's love. And, and I don't mean it has to be a subject, but we don't have a feeling of love for the other person. We have a feeling of wanting something from them 
and we're prepared to sort of have a barter exchange where we give them something if they give the, us something. And often it's very emotional, like an emotional barter system. Like if you make me feel good, I'll make you feel good. If you like tell me I'm a good woman, I'll tell you you're a nice man. If you give me certain feelings, then I'll give you back. You know, it's this exchange thing. That's not what I'm referring to. What I feel the opportunity is when you have a really honest interaction with somebody, even when, you know, they might not be that loving, you can learn so much about the person themselves, about yourself, about the way God's laws work, about all kinds of things. And that's why I love, yeah, I love Divine Truth teachings and I love the principles that are being shared in this um, program that, you know, if you want to experiment with, then you may find some of the same uh you may have some similar experience to what I'm describing now. Another thing in this review that I wanted to cover was feedback systems. As I said, there's many ways that God's giving us continuously feedback. So God's laws are, I suppose, the framework and the first point of call. God's laws are always trying to educate us about love and give us uh, and expose us and teach us more truth. I spoke about um, like how there's pain and pleasure. So when you're in harmony with God's laws, greater happiness, your life is smoother, there's more joy, happiness, opportunities open up. When you're in disharmony with God's laws, then there's, um, it leads to you know, it's a lot more pain and there's suffering. I spoke about how we desensitize to God's laws and we often don't recognize what's happening. And it's a sensitization process in order to get back to actually becoming very sensitive to what God's laws are teaching us. I spoke about external feedback from people who are in a more loving condition than yourself. And that, for me personally, has been the greatest source of change in my entire life. Without the feedback, um, particularly from Jesus and Mary, but also from others like um, my friend Tristan. And, and honestly, actually, like a lot of different people, uh, my spirit friends and my guide and guardian, all of these people just giving me feedback, as well as God's laws, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't have made any changes and I would have felt so much more clueless than I do. It is such a gift for someone to be able to give you loving feedback. And when they genuinely care about you and your best interest, that's not someone like hammering you and telling that you're a bad person and you should change. Um, external, loving external feedback always, like in my experience, always is, you know, is, is loving, kind, uh, attempting to offer solutions to the issue, often understands the causes. Like when someone's in a more loving condition with, than you, so in this case, Jesus, he does un see and understand the cause of what's causing me to do things. And via his feedback and then my experimentation, I'm starting to be able to find like the cause or the why of what I'm doing um, on my own. It just takes a lot longer without the external feedback. So I feel that external feedback is one of the greatest gifts you can also get feedback directly from God. God. God is always wanting to give us feedback. And if we have a sincere longing and desire for to receive God's love, by receiving God's love into our soul, which isn't a felt feeling, it's an overwhelming feeling, that actually exposes a lot of error and and that's sort of how the feedback, you, you get the feedback via feelings. Um, and for me, often it's like it will... I don't need, sometimes I don't necessarily even receive love, but I will feel, oh, here's the next thing inside of me that's preventing me from receiving love. Here's the next thing inside of me preventing me from having a connected relationship with my soulmate. Here's the next thing inside of me that actually is causing a lot of damage in my family to with the relationships with the children. So that's another wonderful feedback mechanism that I feel has been created by God. God has just created so many beautiful, wonderful good things to help us to learn about love and God um, and, you know, and truth. And this process can be a really wonderful, enjoyable process. I've noticed like some people saying, oh, it's so hard and it's so awful and whatever. And I feel for the first while for myself, I felt that too. I felt like, wow, I find this so challenging and it's hard and everything. And I feel that that's because I was just confronted with where I really was at what was going on in myself. I became truthful with myself. I was very judgmental of myself. I was very resistive to feeling emotion. I didn't have a relationship with God. All of those things sort of accumulated into quite a painful experience. And I feel if you it, just stick with it, I encourage you go through that process because eventually you do come out the other end. If you do, you know, if you really are sincere and you really do apply these, you know, these things to your life, 
for me, I also feel that the relationship with God was a game changer for me um, in the sense that I began to sort of get direct feedback sometimes from God and realize that I wasn't just sort of all on my own. And I'm not sure exactly, I have to just reflect a little bit more about the exact process of change there. But it happened that now, like, I really, I just, for me, I love God's way. I love the, the whole the whole way that God has created, it, it does, it's simple. It's like, I know that, like, I, I still, you know, have resistances. I still feel sometimes like, wow, okay, there's some pretty challenging truth about myself. But I don't have the same negative feelings about it that I used to. It's just more like, okay, what am I going to do with that truth? Do I really want to act on it or do I want to remain the same? If I remain the same and I don't do, to, like, do desire to do anything different if I don't actually explore and figure this out and work it out nothing in my life is going to change how long do I want to stay in that place and it just becomes a like the sort of feeling of like well that's your choice and it's not this sort of big drama or or whatever I just am more aware and life is sort of smoother and easier and simpler most of the time when it's not I'm it's really clear okay something's going on for you Eloisa what's happening you know now you've got the tools, you've got the principles, you know, just apply those and you know that things will work out and and you can make some lovely positive change or more loving change if you want. And most of the time when I don't want to do it, it's just I'm, I'm just resistant to accepting some more of God's truth and I usually don't want to do the loving thing for some reason. And if I figure out the reason of why or why I'm justifying not doing it, that often opens up the, you know, the cause of what's going on and then it ends up usually just being some emotion that I'm just trying to avoid because I perceive that it's going to be hard or I'm, you know, angry about feeling it or, you know. And often people are talking about how afraid they are about things. Honestly, a lot of us are just really angry and we need to just go through that. And once we go through that, you know, things can change. So that's covering, um, you know, the basic qualities that we covered and then prayer, conscience and feedback systems. I also, as in the review, just wanted to cover how we've discussed that children are reflecting their environment. Very important thing to remember is that children are not intrinsically bad in any way. Children do not come in like trying to be manipulative or making you bad. They are learning all of that from their environment. And their main people in their environment are generally their parents or caregivers or guardians. That is you. <laughs> Again, if you don't have children, then if you did have children, it would be, but you know, you can then look at your as yourself as a small child in relation to your parents, or you can also take it as yourself in rela relation to anyone else in your environment. Your soul is having an impact on every other soul in the environment. My soul, an impact on every other soul in the environment. And if we're in close proximity with other people and other souls in our environments, we are influencing them. So you can think you are doing nothing because you say nothing or whatever. Whatever is in your soul is influencing the environment. And as adults, you are influencing the children. So the children are reflecting back to you any unhealed emotional injury that is inside yourself. So the more humble we can get, to going, okay, I'm not blaming somebody, I'm going to actually look at myself in this situation, what do I have to learn about love? What inside of me is creating what's happening here? What inside of me is creating that? Then, you know, the more opportunity you have to grow in love and, and to become more truthful. So now we've reviewed a whole number of things. I'd also just like as a reminder to say that the whole parenting resource is focused on love, love and truth. Those are the key, the key things and they're going to be the key principles. It's sort of like the overriding principles of everything. We, you know, we discussed ethics and morality as well and ethics being a way to learn more about love and to understand what is love from, um, you know, from a natural love of, you know, from a human's perspective and how ethics creates equality in relationship, and how you can use ethics as a way to measure whether you're being loving or unloving. And then I also have done a presentation in that presentation on ethics and morality, about how morality is um, what is loving from God's perspective, what is good and evil from God's perspective, what is a sin from God's perspective. 
And sin, again, is just missing the mark of love. And ethics is a wonderful tool that we can use. And as I said, sort of, I suppose, a principle of treating others as you'd like to be treated is a a good way that we can measure when we're being loving or unloving. Um, And in this case, because it's to do with parenting, towards children. But also because in, in a family, there's usually a partner relationship or a lack of partner relationship, you can start to be ethical in the relationship if you're with a partner or if you're separated from a partner and you can practice these things. I um, I also practice it in friendships and any relationship that I have and it's a wonderful way to begin to become more a under, have more understanding about what love is in in relation, you know, in in relationships. Also discussed about how this program is focused so on love, truth and relationship with God. Um, and how, you know, relationship with God is the fastest, most rapid way in order to understand and come to understand love, because I am referring to love from God's perspective. So God is the creator of our soul. God is creator of the universe. That means the creator knows the most about everything, makes logical sense. If you connect with your creator, um, God, you know, God is the creator of all of those things. If we connect with creator of all of those things, God, then we're going to get the most answers because God understands everything that is going on. We only understand like so little. And in my experience, asking God about myself, how God sees me, um, how God feels about the things that I do, uh, all of those things is a wonderful way to gain feedback directly um, from the source. And again, God it work, you know, it communicates via feelings, which comes back to emotion being so important can see how in this review all of the things that we've just reviewed all interrelate and they link. And that's the, when I first started listening to the teachings of divine truth and their principles that will be applied in this program, I kind of sort of took them almost in isolation. What I've learned over time is they all interlink and they all work together. And once they're in your soul, you don't do much thinking anymore. You just act on them and you, you do it. When I have to do a lot of thinking, I know that I don't really understand it yet in my soul. And that's the thing. All of these things, like, not that they merge together, it's that they, they interrelate together and sort of work. They're parts to create a whole. And the things, like the qualities that I've talked about, there's, there's many more qualities. There's so many principles. There's millions of them. This program is just focusing on a few the basic things to get you started if you're interested in experimenting and, um, you know, changing the, the family environment. They're, they're just the very, very basics that you can start working with. When I say that, I keep going back to the basics. Everything that I do, when I get stuck, when I hit a portion, you know, like a little pocket of resistance, I go back to the basics. And these are the basic things that I go back to time, time, time and time again. And everything seems to relate back to them. Like when there's an issue in my life, I I often will just self-reflect to myself and go, right, what's my issue? Okay, issue of truth. I don't want to, you know, tell the truth here. Okay, now I'm being unloving. Okay, well, the fact I don't want to feel it, not being humble. Wow, I really don't want to take action on this because if I take action, then I'm going to have to feel something. I don't want to feel my emotions on that one. Right, so you can see how, like, you know, it all... All fits and then you could be like, well, obviously I've got no desire to do it. Okay, back to the fundamentals. Why don't I have a desire to do it? Find the cause, you know, and figure that out. Why don't I want to feel? Find the cause of why I don't want to feel that. What do I believe is going to happen? What are my false beliefs about this thing? And there's the chain of events that goes through. Now, what I've just spoken is all feelings and it's just this natural process that happens when you actually start feeling and all of that happens without you having to think about it. So while you're having to think about something, it's probably not in your soul, but it can come to be in your soul. I've mentioned a lot of times self-reflection and so I want to add that in. It's not really a review, I've said it, but um, to really define it here. Uh, Self-reflection is an emotional process. I began self-reflecting as an intellectual process but I found that really it is emotional in the sense that you can feel about things that are happening and that's sort of a reflective process. And as you feel, you come to know and understand things. When you don't feel um, and you just intellectually self-reflect, you don't really have the full understanding. And often I've found as I think I know things and then I actually feel through something and I'll be like, oh, it wasn't even what I thought it was. It wasn't what I reflect on. It's actually something completely different. 
And that's the power of your own emotional expression and experience is by allowing yourself to feel the emotions helps you to understand yourself more and really understand yourself. It's via emotions that we become self-aware. It's via our emotional experience that we do. Now, I've noticed um, a lot of people who hear Divine Truth, they want to just then go and focus on emotion. I did, you know, I tried doing that, just the emotions, 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 emotions. I've just got to deal with my emotions. I've just got to deal with my emotions. What I've actually found is that by taking action and on my passions and desires or what I thought they were, or just doing something, the act of doing something has actually brings up emotions. So, you know, it can happen under any circumstances and particularly if you're truthful. Now, if you're in a big facade about everything, whatever, probably not going to happen. But if you tell the truth and you say the truth and you speak your truth and you say, you, know, you say what you feel, and sometimes it's not nice, like it isn't, you know, and, but if you actually are really, really truthful, honest, transparent, open with people, your emotion will come up, guaranteed, absolutely 100% guaranteed. You might be an expert at denial and, um, and shutting down your emotion. So you might not, you might go, oh, what's she talking about? Oh, I can't feel it. Um, but the fact is, is that it's there. I had a lovely chat to, uh, to a woman who, who kept saying to me, I, I can't connect to my, my feelings otherwise. I just can't. Like, I absolutely, like, I don't, I don't feel sad. I can't feel it. I can't connect to it. I can't do it. And I just said to her, well, I don't believe that's true. I feel it's always there. I just feel you've got some pretty heavy mechanisms to shut it down and it was it was quite lovely over a period of time I just kept reminding her saying no I, I don't I don't feel the same way I just feel that you don't want to feel your emotions for some reason you know find the reason what is it you think is going to happen anyway some sort of stuff happened and we were doing a bit of a project together and she ended up she was like oh you know what I realized I am having emotions all the time I have feelings about everything I just don't like most of the feelings that I'm having. So I just like skip over them and I get busy. And then she like related all these different things that she did. Like she gets busy, she tells herself it's nothing, she dismisses it, she minimizes it. She has all these techniques that she uses. And she goes, but you know what? I see what you mean. I have heaps of feelings and I actually can feel them. So then she went off and over a number of weeks, she's begun to sort of, you know, soon as there's just a little tiny feeling, she's had to become self-aware, like have more awareness about what's happening. So she sort of got this intellectual idea and I think she got some inspiration from some spirit friends of hers. And then she started going, sort of recognizing it more over a period of weeks until she actually was like, wow, I actually felt something. She came back one day and said, oh, I actually felt something. And she was only for like five minutes, but I actually felt it. And, you know, she'd set herself up such a fortress of not allowing her feelings out, like keeping her control is what she was using. She was controlling her life so heavily that she felt like she couldn't feel emotion. And I suggest to you that it's very hard, like it's easier to feel emotion than it is to suppress it. Suppressing it has so many negative on-flow effects. Like it just affects everyone around you. It affects you. You feel unhappy. You know, all these things start happening in your life, like breakdowns and things breaking. And, oh, it's like, yeah, sort of like one, just because it's just trying, like the laws, God's laws are just saying, hey, you still haven't felt that. Hey, you know, and they're really gentle at first. The more open I come to my own emotional expression and my own experience and keep acting and doing things, the more I'm noticing how gentle God is with, with feedback. God's trying to guide me all the time to highlight the issues that I have, to lovingly help me feel them with the least, with the smallest event in the kindest way that I can actually recognize. And if I just allow myself to feel right then and there in the moment of what's happening, it doesn't get better. It doesn't escalate. There's not these big dramas that happen. If I refuse to feel it, the more and more resistant, the more resistance I have, the bigger the drama, the bigger the event has to be in order that I actually am humble enough to, to deal with it. And I think of that a lot. I often just reflect on how even when there's large events in my life or things happen to the children, which is still like a law of attraction event for myself, because it's happening within in my, um, you know, what's happening in our family, I often think of just like, well, this is the gentlest way that God can try and help me to learn this lesson that I'm not learning. 
And so then I, then, you know, that can help you to be more reflective. And for me, it was a motivation to actually feel things before it got to that point. And that took a while for me, but it definitely gets smoother and, and yeah, just, it's quite a love, it's quite a lovely experience. Like I enjoy that now uh, more than I ever have. There's still areas that I I'm find, find, yeah, I wouldn't say I enjoy, but I know that I have faith that at some point, if I work through enough, that I will come to feel quite differently about those. We'll see how that goes. So you have covered a number of things in this review now and added a few extra things in. So we've just talked about uh, self-reflection. We've covered love and truth, humility, faith, desire, action, prayer and conscience and feedback systems of God's laws. And um, also we have spirit friends who can give us feedback as well if we're open enough to receive information from the spirit world. Uh, we talked about child, children as being as reflectors. We talked about a bit about, I uh, just reviewed uh, briefly ethics and morality and also the focus of this resource and program of being about love and developing love and truth and relationship with God, being the fastest way to develop those, those things. And also, I've also touched on a number of different terminologies, which I think we'll, we'll look at in another video, but um, just as a, in the review, talked a lot about addictions and how addictions are, we create addictions in ourselves with their physical, emotional, spiritual addictions in order to avoid feeling certain things. So it relates to emotion a lot. When you're in addiction, there's nothing loving about addiction. So the more used to it that you can get like, all right, you know, you're not a loving person if you want your addictions met, the better it's going to be. The, we also, I also have covered uh, just about relationships and about how, um, having close connected relationships with children and with adults, of how to do those with more truth in a relationship and more love and being humble, all of the things that we've sort of spoken about, all of those will help to have close connected relationships. In this review, that's sort of like all, quite a bit of the terminology and different sort of concepts we've talked about and divine truth basics. I've also covered in the, these preliminary talks or these introductory um, presentations some key points and some principles, and I want to make those clear now. So firstly, I've said it many times, one of the principles is that real change is soul-based emotional change. No change can happen unless it is soul-based change. And that is an emotional process that you have to go through to have change. So physical actions are not proper change. Like at some point, you will revert back to what you've always done if it's only a physical change. So that's a key principle. On change, so it needs to be soul-based change, is you can only change yourself. So we spoke about looking at yourself first. You are the main character in your life. Anything that's happening in your environment, you will have some, um, there'll be something for you to learn about love in that attraction. So you can't change others, you can only change yourself. Right? Can't change others, you can only change yourself. No getting around that, that that's it. And you know, the other one, only soul bars change, that's real change. And that's an emotional process. Can't get around that either. <laughs> really important, those two principles, all right? So soul-based change, and you can only change yourself. So in those two things, where uh, I sort of commented in one of the presentations about looking at yourself first. So when there's something that happens in your life, look to you and go, all right, what's the attraction for me? And that doesn't mean that you're not going to figure out what's happening with everybody else, but you are going to look first at yourself. So often we want to blame or look for an external reason why something's happened in our life. When we are humble, we'll look at what happened for us, like what in us has attracted this event? What in, you know, what in me has helped create this? What, when the behavior happens, say, with children, what is going on in me that is attracting this or creating this behavior? Do I have a demand on my environment? Are they responding to that? Do I have an expectation that's going on? Are they responding to that? And this is all emotional. A lot of the time it might seem that you have no physical, you know, you might, I uh, can't see that really happening, but sometimes you might go, I'm not, don't have a physical demand. I don't want anything. Again, need to go back to the soul, 
you know, the human soul, which we've reviewed in this, this book, and, and saying, all right, I'm in my soul, what's coming out of my soul? You can see how you need to get sensitive to what's really happening in your soul, because otherwise it's quite hard to know what's going on in your life, because that's the real conversation is soul to soul, you know, and that's what the children, children in your care are responding to, that's what your partner's responding to, you know, not your words, and that's what you're responding to under all circumstances as well. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where someone's talking and the whole feelings that you're getting and everything you're experiencing, you're just like, whoa, they just don't match up. I come from a family where that's just huge. What the words that are being said and the feelings that are happening are two completely different things. And now it's quite hard. Like I often don't even listen to the words and sometimes I then respond and say things and people are like, oh, that's not what I'm talking about. And I'm, and I, and I'm sort of catch myself and go, whoa, hold on, all right. You know, and I'm like, no, of course not. It's because that's the feeling conversation with us and that's the conversation I'd like to have, you know. And also the one now that I suppose that I have most of the time. Again, I can't feel everyone perfectly. So again, I just look to myself. I do that principle. Okay, what, what's in this for me? What can I learn about love here? What truth am I missing, you know, or what truth, it, you know, is going to happen here, all of those kind of things. Yeah, so we talked a lot about God's laws and things and the law of attraction, which is really that, you know, I mean, that principle of like looking at yourself first and you being the only person who can change. That's a lot about the law of attraction. The law of attraction is bringing events into your life for you to learn more about love. It's to refine your soul in love and teach you more truth if you're open to receiving it. And that's what is happening with God's laws. That's what the goal is of, you know, of this, this resource is to say, all right, where am I out of harmony with love? What's the law of attraction showing me? What are God's laws highlighting to me? What are they trying to make you know, explicit to me so that I can make some loving, truthful changes in my life? I spoke about the principle of treating others as you would like to be treated or basic ethics. And that's a very important one that can help you to learn about love. And so that's another thing to, to enact in your life. I also spoke about morality and that being what is right and good or you know, good and evil or love from God's perspective. So that is a, um, something that with a relationship with God, it's going to help you to understand and come to understand that. And there's, well, you know, that will help you as you go along. So we've covered now some the sort of basic key points and principles. We've covered the qualities to develop in order that will help you if you choose to engage this, um, this resource. We've also covered like the, hum the basic, basic, basics of the human soul, just that you are a soul, and that's the real you. How your thoughts, actions, and um, uh, words, if they match up, it's a wonderful thing to do a quality to develop and a really lovely gift to share with others. They don't then have to try hard to know what's really going on for you. Um, it's you know transparent. It's it's not misleading in any way. It's obvious. You're open, transparent. There's so much to be said for truth, transparency, honesty, both with yourself and also with others. Children will benefit from it. I also spoke about how your children actually are listening to what your soul is saying and what you are doing, like what you're modeling. So that's what you're really doing. They are actually responding to that. Your words are cheap. They are. And I suggest not like I've, I've had to go sometimes now when I speak, I just have to go, wow, I can see it. I'm like, no one's listening. Just stop. Am I really sincere about what I'm saying? If I'm not, don't go get sincere about it. If I am, well, and they're not listening, what is going on that they're not listening? You know, like let's address that thing in our in our family situation. And that's sort of a change, a shift that's sort of happened in me lately. Is like I used to try and talk and talk and talk, and because we go yeah 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 yeah, nothing happens. So what I realised is either that what I was saying were just empty words and it wasn't really how I felt. And I was like, that's a feedback system for me to go, oh, yep, all right, that's not in my heart yet. Or sometimes the, the kids are just like, no, nah, we don't have to listen to mum, we don't want to because they don't actually want to have the, the conversation that I'm having. So then I can reflect on that. Sometimes it's just an interaction for me to feel like, wow, like people don't want to listen to me. They're all, all for me, all self-reflective things. I don't share any of that with the kids. I just 
you know, that's what's going on inside of me. And then I go and work on that. So all of these things can help you to, to learn more about love and more about truth. And if you want a relationship with God, you know, God can work with us when we're truthful and honest and transparent. God can't work with our facade because it's not the real, like, it's not really how we feel or what we think or, you know, what we, it's a fake thing we're presenting to others. I, can't, I see it as a lie that we want others to believe because we want to feel, you know, it's really what we want to believe about ourselves and we want others to agree, be in agreement with that thing. It's much more pleasant, enjoyable, fun to interact with someone who's being their real self. And I encourage you to be your real self. So in, I feel like that's probably wraps up this review. I've sort of covered all the main points. If you want a bit more extensive information, I suggest you go to previous videos. Um, you know, there's an ethics morality one. There's um, the Divine Truth Basics. It's an introductory video. Uh, the one other thing that I did want to review was just the provision that God has made for parents, be parents on earth. And some of those things of how the responsibility of the parent or the provisions God's made is for parents to educate children about God, the Creator, and also about the universe, about making God's laws explicit so that they can see that when they break God's laws that there's pain and when they live in harmony with God's laws that there's you know, it's a pleasurable experience and there's a lot of opportunities and enjoyment from doing so. Also to expose to children all of the external wonders of the universe and encourage them to explore and uh, engage with that to find their own soul passions and desires We're, and doing all of that without imposing or uh, pushing our, our, you know, our belief systems upon them but even just allowing them that opportunity to that there are those possibilities and for them to have the opportunity to, to explore and discover those things themselves. I see very, very, very few of us parents doing that. We're not being real parents from God's perspective. We have a lot of investments and unloving demands and expectations on children and we want children to do certain things and be a certain way and that's not loving on our, on our part. Um, I also spoke about how a parent is responsible for the creation of the family. We are the authority in the family and we can be a loving authority or we can be a dictator and an unloving authority, you know. We can be a punisher, we can hurt people. We've talked also just as another review point about correction and education and educating and correcting rather than punishing a child for certain mistakes they might make or not doing what we want, which is unloving demand that they should do what we want anyway. If you educate somebody in the best possible way to do something um, that you understand at the time, you know, like, and I'm thinking of, say, simple physical things, but also spiritual things, uh, just the key point is if we don't understand ourselves how to do something, we can't educate another person. And I think that's probably where parents run into a lot of troubles. We can't educate another person if we don't understand ourselves. And there's so much we don't understand. And we need to give up thinking we're experts, thinking that we know things, because thinking we're right, thinking that our belief systems are the only way, trying to impose those on others. And children, you know, they're just these lovely little open books and little sponges who are just sponging up everything in their environment. And it's a disservice to them and an unloving act to enforce or impose our beliefs on them. If we just make God's laws transparent to them, they will learn because that correction method is already, and you know, the restriction of God's laws, or when you do an unloving act, is already in process. It's already happening all the time. It's far better than human law or parental law. Um, in saying that, in a loving home, you would have loving laws within your home, you know, so that things don't get destroyed and that violence isn't encouraged and all those kind of things, you would emulate God's laws within your home. Absolutely. But as we were talking about just before this sort of tangent was just about correcting and educating, not punishing. And often, you know, punishment is about power or belittling somebody or making them feel bad or, you know, harming them. That's not how God works. God's never punishing us. Our parents have punished us, but not God ever. God's just trying to correct us gently in the most gentle possible way. Say, hey, you're out of harmony with love and truth here. What in you is causing that? You know, if you find out and correct that and be in harmony with God's laws, wonderful. All of these wonderful things are open now to you. You know, more freedom, more 
um, exploration, more opportunities, all these wonderful gifts I can now gift to you because you're in harmony with law. As soon as we're out of harmony with law, just the law's already, that's why the law's there. It's just to correct. It's just a complete, consistent, absolutely perfected, the same every time for the same issue, the same, you know, correction is applied to anybody, no matter who they are, no matter what they're doing, it is applied if it's the same thing. So, you know, there's obviously some things are more severely unloving than others. And so they have a greater penalty upon them. Like say, taking someone's life, I feel is probably a, a you know, a very unloving thing. But so is living in your fear and, and encouraging it. That is an exceptionally unloving thing to do. Like us not dealing with our own fears and justifying our fears and thinking that they're okay. That is the cause of war and terrible, terrible like mistreatment of people on the earth. And it's like the fundamental basis of so much violence and harm because we just don't want to feel an emotion of fear. And, you know, there have been probably some fearful events in certain people's lives, but a lot of us are living in our fears and living in fear is exceptionally detrimental and unloving to the environment, to the natural environment and to the world at large and to, a, to our fellow humans. It's something that we need to work through in order that we no longer live in fear. And that is, you know, just it's, it's what causes wars and trauma and all kinds of unloving actions towards others, where particularly when we justify it. So something to look at and to work through and to see it for what it is. So to summarize, I've covered a whole lot of different things in this review of um, qualities of love, truth, humility, faith, action, um, emotion, desire. I also covered uh, feedback systems and prayer, having a sincere longing to God about for uh, and which and a pure prayer and sincere longing will always be answered. We talked about a bit about the conscience, about children as reflectors, about the human soul and that you are a real soul and have a soulmate. We talked about ethics and morality in a brief description of what they are, how you can use ethics in order to start to understand what is and what is not love and how you measure that in your own family. So uh, a whole lot of things we've discussed and I encourage you to you know reflect upon what's happened we talked a bit about self-reflection I just reflect on your life about the things that have been discussed if you've had any like emotional responses or feelings come up about these things or disagreements I encourage you to you know work through those and figure out what is it that challenged you or what is it that you didn't like or what's the cause of your reaction you can start applying some of these things that we've talked in brief already immediately to your own life if you're interested. I know as a fact that by applying all of these things to my life I have learnt about what love is and um, I don't understand it fully or as an entirety but I know that I have the tools and the mechanisms and the understanding at least well I feel now in my own heart but at the beginning I just have the intellectual things to begin the process. And then it was via experiment, uh, experimenting and experience it that I came to understand the truth in my own heart. I cannot encourage you enough or suggest enough how no change is going to happen unless it's soul-based change. And that will be changing your relationship with feeling emotion um, because that is the way that things are going to change in your soul. Again, I refer you to the teachings of Divine Truth, which can be found at divinetruth.com. Jesus and Mary or A.J. Miller and Mary Luck have hundreds of hours of information that flesh all of these concepts that I'm speaking about out. I do want these videos and this resource to be able to be applied even if you haven't um, watched those videos because I feel like applying the principles to parenting, you can at least get these basic things that you can start taking action in your own life. And if you apply the principles, over time you will actually start to come to understand things and see things for, a, for, for, you know, for what's really happening in your life and you'll be able to see some changes that can probably occur in your um, home quite rapidly. Again, just remember that if no change is happening and nothing's ch ch happening, you need to figure out, okay, are you really sincere about what's happening? Are you really hitting the right thing that's happening in your family or is it actually something different? And, you know, these principles and um, qualities and various tools that we've spoken about can help you to sort of 
nut out what's really happening in your family and where you might be going wrong and where you need to refine the process and all of these kind of things. The, some, in some of the future videos that will happen, there'll be a lot more discussion on taking like some of these qualities, like looking really in depth at principles of love and truth and looking at examples in, in various family life that may, you know, that you can sort of start to get a bit of picture of how to do, of, of what might be happening in your life that might be similar or taking the principles and giving it a go. Like um, maybe I suggest a few experiments, some self-reflection that you can do, just some things that you can start looking at in your own life and practically apply it. Uh, again, just have a go and keep an open mind as you're going. And if you don't have an open mind and you feel like you don't like it at all, figure out why. Um, you know, it's the best way to then understand what's really driving it and what's really you know, causing you to do it. Some, some people will say, yes, I really want to do this, but again, examine your motivations and intentions. Another thing that we briefly talked about and we'll talk a lot more about. Your motivations and intentions are as important as your actions. So God measures those and God's laws assess those in everything you do. So you may take an action that seems really nice and even might seem loving, but if your intention was just to selfishly get something out of it for yourself, it's not a, a loving action, you know. It's something that you wanted and you're doing it for a selfish motivation. And it's important to see these things about yourself because then you can understand yourself more and then you can come to understand love more and understand truth more. So any, any piece of information that you can know more about yourself is a very worthwhile thing to know. So pretty much there's a lot that's been said in this review. I sort of was just going to like touch on things but it, ended up realizing I needed to expand a bit more on various bits and pieces. Brings me to the end of the review proper and I think we'll just do some little reviews from time to time throughout the, the resource to, so that um, you know you can kind of come and get a bit of a summary and then go and search for more information if you missed something or you didn't quite get, get what was going on. Yeah, again, if you'd like to contact me, feel free. Um, you can contact me via the Contact Me page on my website, which is aloisalh.com. So it's, I'll put a little link there rather than spelling it out. And there'll be a number of other links as well that reference various recommended viewing and reading material. If you need to pause at any time in these um, videos, please do. I've noticed sometimes I get quite inspired about different things and sort of start chatting away about various things and I realize that if this is all new and the first time that you've heard any of these things there's probably a lot to take in and you will have a lot of questions I suggest so yeah please send them through and I will try and make videos that answer them in to the best capacity or point you in the direction of principles that you could apply to have a go at or little experiments that you could do in order to find the answers yourself. In the end, I'm hoping that this resource is just an inspiration and that you'll come to, in your own heart, understand the principles of, you know, of God's truth so well that you won't need a resource or to rely on anyone else. You know, you, if you develop a relationship with God and you come to understand your own self, you won't need, need this to do anything. You, it's just the education process to find out more about love. For me, I know that the teachings of divine truth and having the feedback of Jesus and Mary and their friendship is just amazing because it helps me rapid, more rapidly grow, see myself more honestly, far more rapidly. I also, they just know so much more than I do and they always will because they're at a different stage than I am, which is such a gift to be able to have, you know, they're so generous with the information that they, they gift and what they share and I'm you know, always referring back to the teachings of divine truth myself in order to understand things more fully. As I said in one of the very, very early videos, I'm where I'm at. This is just, you know, I'm just sharing things that have worked in my life, that have changed my relationship in a positive manner with the children in our care, that have caused me to, you know, have, I feel much happier and uh, my life is a lot more smoother, I'm exploring more of my own passions and desires. Um, you know, all kinds of wonderful opportunities have opened up in my life by going through all of the things that I'm suggesting do, to do here. Um, as I also said, I'll be truthful and transparent when I don't know things. I don't claim to understand everything or have a 
soul condition right at this moment to be able to help you necessarily with the causes of everything that's happened in your life. But I can help you with the principles which when applied under any situation or any scenario or circumstance, they can help you to find out about yourself. Remember, you are you and God are the expert on your life. You're the one who's lived your life. You're the ones who's had your experiences. I haven't. You have. And God's the best person because God knows every single thing about you. And that's why, to me, you know, being in facade or lying to yourself and not being truthful and not being truthful with others, I don't know, it doesn't make much sense to me. God already knows us warts and all, if you like. And, you know, if we're hiding from ourselves and not seeing ourselves as God sees us, well, it kind of is. It's like, you know, when a little kid thinks that you don't see what they're doing. You know, they're sort of behind the couch or whatever, or they come out and you're like, oh, have you been in my makeup? And they're like, no, mummy. And they have like lipstick all over their face. I kind of feel like that's what we're like with God sometimes of sort of like, no, no, God, we're really a nice person. And God's like, well, you're out of harmony's love here and we're sin here. And, and not in a nasty way, just saying, you know, I can see you as you are. I've seen what you've done. Why are you trying to hide from that yourself? You know, l l you know, work through the reasons why you did it. So you never do it again and move on. You know, there's much more happy, wonderful opportunities you've got ahead of you. And sometimes I imagine what, you know, God would be like as, as my parent. And, and go, I go to God to, to receive counsel or to ask questions. And as I said, I've got some really wonderful friends as well who I can go to when I'm quite blocked to God and, and my relationship with God is not, not open. And that happens quite a lot on various issues. And I suspect it will until I work through all of the issues I have um, in my own personal life. And I suggest that will be the same for, for anyone who's, who's engaging this way in order to become a more loving, honest, open, truthful, you know, person. Anyway, that concludes my uh, review so far. And uh, yeah, best wishes until I see you again.